city. Uh, this is uh, one of the events for the indigenous peoples here at the COP21. And uh, our, uh, our event is, in, is titled Indigenous Peoples' Rights and Land Tenure, Fostering Partnerships to Tackle Climate Change. Uh, of course, we know that the respect and recognition of indigenous peoples' rights customary land tenure and traditional knowledge have significantly contributed to more sustainable use and management of various ecosystems and landscapes. This has been documented in a variety of studies, but most recently by a report by the Rights and Resources Institute. We know that lands managed by indigenous peoples and local communities play a crucial role in stewarding the world's natural carbon stock, harboring some of the world's most carbon-rich and undeveloped places. Private sector interests in these landscapes create both enormous risks and opportunities for these communities. There is ample evidence that the government development plans and projects, private corporations investments have and are continuing to cause indigenous peoples criminalization, displacement, and depletion of the resources that are within their own territories. So for this event, we would like to ask the key questions to be addressed by our panel of speakers. One, given the extractive hydropower and agricultural development projects that which are putting tremendous pressure on natural landscapes and on indigenous and community territories, how can stakeholders work together to achieve a triple win for people, private sector, and the government? What is the role of governments in supporting uh, customary indigenous land tenure through the regulation of community and corporate relations. Third, what are good practices and challenges for implementing rights and approaches to private sector engagement in indigenous and community territories? And what is the role of companies, government, and indigenous peoples working together in this area? What are the opportunities and challenges faced by the indigenous peoples in relation to the report and recognition of rights, land tenure, and traditional knowledge? And lastly, what has been done by indigenous peoples to contribute to sustainable management of various ecosystems and landscapes within their territories. All of these questions will be addressed by our presenters. And uh, after their presentation, we will be having a question and answer where you can also raise your questions or comments. Uh, so for now, uh, we have an interesting panel here. Uh, there are five indigenous peoples uh, who are in the panel. Uh, and then we have one from private corporation and one from government. So we will also hear the response from the private sector and also from the government on what the indigenous peoples will be sharing here today. Uh, as the first speaker, may I call for Joanne Carling. She is the executive director of the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, based in Thailand, but uh, working in uh, uh, all the countries in, within Asia. Joanne. Hello. Yeah, um, good afternoon to everyone. Wow, the lights. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I want to kick off the discussion here on what can be the framework of partnerships that we can have as indigenous peoples with states, with the private sector, with civil society organizations, including conservation organizations. First of all, I, I want to, to say that we cannot proceed from business as usual if we want to have partnerships to effectively combat climate change. And what do I mean by this? Uh, 
as, as also mentioned by Peter a while ago on uh, of C4, we need a more holistic framework and a sustainable approach on how we deal with uh, climate change. And when we say holistic approach, we need to go beyond looking only at the economic or commercial values of natural resources, because then this is the, the conflict of the worldview of indigenous peoples. Because for us, in the case of forest, we look at forest as the source of our culture, the source of, of uh, our food, the, the source of our identity, and it's, 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 it's very much what we are. So we don't look at forest in terms of the, the, the timber that you can sell in the market, right? We don't look at the forest just on carbon. It is, it is life for us. But once we look at the forest in terms of like before the issue of, of climate change, forest is regarded for the timber value. Depends the, the wood, the trees are measured in terms of its value as a timber that is dictated by the market. The uh, flora and fauna is the same. And now with climate change, it's already seen in terms of its carbon and how much is carbon. And that is the direction of conservation that is being advocated now in the context of climate change. And this has been our big argument in the discussion on red, for example, that we cannot just look at, 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 at forest as carbon, but include the non-carbon values uh, and multipurpose of, of the forest. So that kind of thinking, the holistic approach, should be the way that, that, the way that will guide us for any kind of, of, of partnership. And so we need to go beyond, first, the, the, also the narrow conservation approach where we just uh, leave, uh, you know, spots a group of just isolated so-called national parks and conservation areas and, and take, drive out the, the people living there and then convert all the landscapes into biofuel plantations, into monocropping. That kind of narrow conservation approach is not also going to work. Because for indigenous peoples, we manage our resources accordingly on what we need and for the common good. That is, th those are the principles that we value. And these are also the principles and values that we want to define the kind of partnership we will engage in in finding effective solutions to climate change. So now, um, the, the other one, what, what, what partnerships already exist? That is one of the questions being asked uh, on the, uh, for this panel. Uh, I'm not sure yet if there's any kind of a holistic partnership, but what I, I really want to mention is that there should also be a need of a, a strong policy, especially the partnership with states, a policy and measure on the recognition, respect, and fulfillment of indigenous people's rights. That's, that's, that's the rights framework. And unless that is provided, we cannot, we are prevented, in fact, to, make, to give the most that we can contribute for climate change solutions. Because we will always remain vulnerable in our lands, territories, and resources if they are not protected. And the reason why we're making the biggest contribution to climate change is because of our practice of sustainable, our sustainable lifestyle, our low carbon footprint uh, uh, lifestyle, our sustainable resource management, and the use of our traditional uh, knowledge. And if, if these are threatened by, by proposed solutions of climate change, we're talking about biofuels, we're talking about nuclear plants, we're talking about 
large hydro dams that are going to be established in our territories. And even, even renewable energy that are done in, an, in a commercial way and without our consent and our particip participation is not going to work. Uh, for one, in, 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 in my hometown in, in, in the Philippines, they are actually planning to, to build a windmill up in a, uh, a, a very f uh, fragile uh, hill and a sacred mountain for us. But it's going to be set up by a company that will run it commercially and we will have to pay the power. And where will the people get the money to pay the power and at the same time having our mountain destroyed. So renewable energy, if it becomes a viable solution, should also not be done simply in the context of, again, commercial and driven by the market, but rather driven by the need and in partnership with communities. It's good to have energy decentralized. That is that is now what is coming out as the most effective and the most effective way of dealing with that. It is if it is also co-managed by indigenous peoples. To, to give you an example, our member in, in, in Malaysia, the network of indigenous peoples, they've been building mini hydro in different villages and it's the villages who run those mini hydros. They direct it to what they need. So they have a sense of ownership and it doesn't destroy their resources and it even enhances their livelihoods uh, and, and, and uh, their, their livelihoods and even income. So these are, these are the kind of, of practical solutions that is actually based on, on a partnership that will contribute to, uh, to finding solutions to climate change. Uh, finally, I also want to mention the kind of partnership that we are having with a lot of, of uh, civil society organizations. And this is what we call the, the global call to action to recognize land rights for indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, this is a global campaign that aims to double the land tenure or land security, land recognition uh, of ind indigenous peoples and, and local communities. And it will, go, it will be launched uh, in March next year. We are doing this in, uh, with uh, Oxfam, with RRI, with IL, uh, uh, International Land Coalition and many other or organizations because we need this kind of partnership that, that truly not just recognize our rights, but taking action of how our rights are going to be protected at the ground level so that we can contribute the most in terms of food security, in terms of protection of Mother Earth, in terms of sustainable development. And this, com this global campaign will will be uh, having a, a, a contribution or, or what we call a political ask from states to have uh, policies and measures that will recognize the rights of indigenous peoples over their lands and resources and also implement these measures because there are already countries that have land rights in their national laws, but they are not being implemented well. Uh, so, so that's one. We also want uh, companies, the private sector, to first and foremost respect indigenous people's rights, ensure that free, prior, and informed consent is done when they are doing their activities, uh, and, and that they ha also have to be transparent in the way they, they conduct their business, they respect or have clear measure in terms of equitable benefit or uh, benefit sharing. These are the kind of, of these are the, the criteria that we think can work if we will have partnership with the private sector. We need to go away from, from the narrow commercial profit driven interest and really contribute to how uh, we work together to attain equity and to attain sustainable development and putting people
people at the center. That is, that is the way we should build partnerships uh, in relation not only to climate change, but also in relation to sustainable development. Uh, and I want to conclude with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. We will now move quickly to our next speaker. She is Andrea Carmen. She is the Executive Director of the Indian, International Indian Treaty Council. Sorry, I need technical assistance. Escape. There. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Leo Simchani Abo Mawaiyaim. Respectful greetings to you, my relatives, and my Yaki Inan language. Our nation is in what is known as Southern Arizona, United States, and Northern Sonora, Mexico, uh, in the country of Mexico. I'm going to start by just showing um, the slide. And it really shows the purpose of our struggle against climate change and the impacts of climate change. I, these are uh, a young indigenous woman in California gathering the wild foods and a young indigenous woman who's from Arizona. And she's uh, showing our sacred food, the corn. And these are the very things that are threatened, not just our traditional foods, but also the health well-being of our future generations and their very survival. Our young people are the ones who are looking to us today to make the decisions that will ensure their survival in the future and their children's as well. It's important when we talk about a rights-based approach that we understand that all the way back in 1948 with the founding's human rights document of the United Nations, that the right to food was recognized for all members of the human family. This is the opening line or one of the opening lines of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, adopted in 1948. And it says that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food. Also, it's important to recognize that the states, the countries of the world, have put this concept into legally binding language in the two human rights covenants, Article 1 in common of the two human rights covenants that almost every country in the world have ratified, including the United States that doesn't like to ratify very much, says, in no case may a people be deprived of its own means of subsistence. And this is traditional uh, salmon fishing um, on one one of the few rivers that's left undammed uh, in the Northwest United States. It's very important for our organization that began to work at the United Nations in 1977, uh, taking our treaties, which are also nation-to-nation -nation agreements between settler governments and indigenous nations uh, to the United Nations and uh, seek their recognition as inter international instruments. And in many of them, the treaty right to food is also underscored and put into legally binding language. And this is just a quote from one of the uh, treaties, one of the over 300 ratified treaties that we as indigenous nations have in the United States. It's the 1837 U.S. Treaty with the Chippewa Nation, which underscores the continuing right to hunt, fish, and gather on the lands of the Chippewa Nation. This is the framework for partnership, and it actually states it in the preamble, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is now the internationally recognized international standard for the survival, dignity, and well-being of the indigenous peoples of the world. And this is what we're fighting right now as we speak over at COP21, that the rights of indigenous peoples, as recognized 
by this internationally adopted minimum standard um, are, are recognized, fully recognized uh, in the agreement uh, for the reasons that Joanne um, stated earlier. And this is uh, the process of the UN Declaration, just really quickly, starting in 1977. Many of the founders of our organization are shown there marching into the United Nations for the first time. And exactly 30 years later, this is the adoption of the UN Declaration at the UN General Assembly. What does the Declaration say that we're fighting for today? And again, this is the basis for partnership, not only with states, but with civil society and with corporations as we move forward to find real solutions that are viable and respect rights uh, in this process that's happening here in this beautiful city. Uh, the core uh, of the land rights provisions is Article 26, which says that indigenous peoples have the right to the lands, territories, and resources which they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used and acquired. And it also calls upon states to recognize these traditional lands legally. And this is a picture of uh, Chickaloon, Alaska. Um, it also, very important, and this is a lot of people's favorite article in the Declaration, talks about our spiritual relationship with our traditional lands, resources, waters, ice, and our responsibility to future generations in this regard. And I think this is not a responsibility only of indigenous peoples, but of all of us in this room. And that's the core partnership we have to recognize, is our partnership, not just with the natural world and Mother Earth, but with our future generations, seven generations into the future. That is the core partnership we're talking about and the core responsibility. These are uh, children learning how to cut up moose nose um, in, also in Alaska. Also, the UN Declaration underscores our right to the enjoyment of our own means of subsistence. This is berry picking, very important to many indigenous peoples um, throughout North America. It also, for the first time in a human rights instrument, recognizes uh, the right to the environment and the productive capacity of our lands. And all of these rights are rights that are directly threatened by climate change today. This is something that um, Joanne also referred to, is the way that indigenous peoples are impacted, not just by the effects of climate change, but the causes of climate change. And our lands in North America are targeted as what they call national sacrifice areas for energy extraction, whether it's coal, oil, and in this case, we're looking at the tar sands in Canada, the biggest gas producer, greenhouse gas producer in all of Canada. No other um, source, even cars, automobiles, are as large as the tar sands. And it also violates Article 32, which is the right, is the right to free prior informed consent and development, which is a core right that must be upheld in the spirit of partnership uh, for any climate change agreements, including continuing to address the causes through extractive industries. This is actually my husband <laughs> um, showing one of uh, the young women from our tribe how to protect the traditional plants um, that we use. This is our land in Arizona, our family farm. And this is the right um, upheld that's very important that it is spelled out in the agreement, in the Paris Agreement, our right to traditional knowledge and to safeguard our seeds, our knowledge of flora and fauna, because this is something that indigenous peoples can offer to the solutions to climate change. But we have to have those rights protected uh, first and foremost. That's Article 31 of the UN Declaration. And also the right to participate in decision making. And I'm not sure if you know this, but we are actually shut out of most of the debates going on about the very decisions that will affect our lives and survival. We have to find out what's happening from um, some very few indigenous peoples that are able to get inside with state credentials. So this is actually a right being violated today. But we want to make sure that the agreements that are coming out of Paris here um, uh, on climate change include that spirit of partnership, which means we will participate in the decisions and how they're implemented, especially, as Joanne mentioned, on our own lands and territories.
Really briefly, and I know we, our time is short, but I just want to highlight some of the ways that climate change is affecting us. And it's important to recognize that the UN Rapporteur on the Right to Food also said back in 2009 that climate change constitutes the single most important threat to food security in the future. And in the United States and North America, um, we're experiencing the, the um, this is Moore, Oklahoma, 2013, the largest tornado ever recorded in the history of the world. And the impact on many indigenous peoples in that part of the country is very extreme. Our forests are drying. That bottom picture shows 38,000 acres that have been totally destroyed of forest lands by insects that are moving north and, and proliferating because of climate change. And these are just two fires this year in British Columbia, Canada, and California that devastated the lands of indigenous peoples and are predicted to increase with a combination of insect destruction of forests and drought. We know about the melting ice in the Arctic and the impact on the traditional food and subsistence of the indigenous peoples there that is becoming scarce. This is a picture of salmon. A lot of times we just look at, oh, it's the Pacific, the island peoples or the Arctic peoples. This is California, United States, and the traditional food sources of the indigenous peoples there are predicted to not survive past the end of this century if the current rate of climate change happens. This year on the Columbia River, there was an 80% die off of salmon because of warming river water. This is Mexico and our traditional territory is over on the left side and it shows the areas, the red areas where our corn, our sacred corn, which is the basis of our subsistence, is no longer to grow, no longer able to grow because of drought, decreased rainfall. Now I'm going to end with a couple of solution slides. Um, this is uh, our work right now, right today as we speak, um, over there. Um, at the COP21, indigenous peoples are demanding um, full participation. We're demanding that our rights be upheld as uh, contained in the, the minimum standard, the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that our traditional knowledge is respected and free prior informed consent is respected, as well as real reductions uh, in greenhouse gas emissions, and we're really pushing for the 1.5 uh, centigrade increase, not the 2% that some of the industrialized countries are, are accepting, and because 2% um, is way too much for our traditional lifestyles to sustain. But it's really important to recognize the traditional knowledge that indigenous peoples have to offer the world, not just the, the negative impacts, because this will be the basis of partnership moving forward. The Thule marshes that uh, the California Indian people are working to protect uh, are the places for sacred sites, um, the gathering of traditional um, products such as this canoe, but they also absorb 10 times more carbon than a mature pine forest do. So our traditional life ways, our cultural and sacred sites protection efforts are also responses and solutions to climate change. This is partnerships that indigenous peoples are developing through trading seeds. Some indigenous peoples have preserved traditional seeds that are drought resistant, that can grow with hardly any water. And now we're trading seeds again, as we did in time immemorial with each other. This is the second International Indigenous Peoples Corn Conference, where indigenous peoples from Mexico, Guatemala, and Oklahoma, United States are trading traditional seeds and sharing that knowledge with each other. The elders are teaching, again, our young people, and this is an elder teaching gathering of wild plants, especially how to cope with the changing conditions and how that means gathering is happening at different times traditionally. But these are survival um, knowledge that are being passed on. Um, this is an elder teaching the young people about salmon, but also talking about the struggle to remove those dams so that the salmon can survive. That water has to flow freely again. And this again is a partnership with corporations, states, and indigenous peoples if it's going to work and we're going to save the salmon. Lastly, I just want to end with the importance of the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples. 
And this is uh, Roberta Blackgoat. Many of you maybe have heard of her or know her. Um, she's one of the Dene or Navajo elders that was very involved in the fight for the UN Declaration, and it was a fight, believe me, to get a text that we could accept as the minimum standard. Um, and she said many years ago, she's from Navajo or Dene, which is where lands have been uh, devastated by coal mining for many years. And she said that coal is the liver of Mother Earth. It has to stay in the ground so that she can be healthy. This is traditional knowledge that now is scientifically supported and is the basis for the transition that all participants are calling for away from the fossil fuel economy and to sustainable um, ways of production and, and uh, energy generation. And indigenous peoples in the spirit of partnership have much to contribute to that discussion over at the COP. 21 and into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea Carmen. Now we move quickly again to Per Jonas. He's a board member of the Sami Arctic uh, Youth Council. Not really, no. <laughs> I'm a board member of International Center for Reindeer Husbandry. Okay. Uh, but thank you for having me here. Uh, just gonna get in. So yes, um, I would like to start saying that uh, I am born and raised in, in Leva Sami village, uh, uh, which is uh, a reindeer herding district in the uh, at the Swedish side of Sápmi. And my family has worked with uh, reindeer husbandry long before Sweden even became a country. Uh, when no borders existed in the northern part of the Scandinavia. So the reindeer is one of the cornerstones of the Sami culture and landscape in the Arctic, which is my heritage. It's where I find my safety, love, identity, and further where my future will be. And I want to start by uh, showing uh, how a young reindeer herder from Satmi wishes that his future will be. And this vision comes from a workshop um, held last year, and it's a part of the alien project connected and supported by the Arctic Council. And it goes like this. Today I'm still at the workshop learning something new. Tomor tomorrow I'm on my snow snowmobile in the forest watching my reindeers. Next week I'm at the Jokmok winter market uh, after that, of course, learning how to apply for starting funds for my uh, herding business. In three months, their spring will be here. I work somewhere to get some extra money. In six months, for a year, I got the starting funds I needed and bought reindeer for a good price. Two 2017, I'm happy at the sixth World Congress for reindeer herders, maybe lecturing about my success. In five years, the hardest time are past. Now it's getting easier. The business is working well. In 10 years, reindeer husbandry is more accepted by the outside society. And in 20 years, I'm 39 on the top of my life. I may be the chairperson in the Sami village who has a strong and powerful position in the society. Sure, it's, it's a nice vision and not not impossible to achieve and hopefully it will become reality but unfortunately it seems to be a long way to go uh, given the political problems regarding the land issues that the reindeer herders herding people are struggling with and Zatmi and Scandinavia uh, is it not an uh, exception on the grazing lands that my family borrows from future generation for our reindeers has one of the oldest and the largest underground mines in the world. Um, the state-owned iron ore mining company Alcoa B has occupied parts of our main uh, grazing lands uh, for over 125 years. And uh, the area that they are taking is growing larger and larger for every day. The Sami reindeer herding people live a nomadic type of life. 
We follow our reindeers from high alpine in the summer to low lands during the winter. This since the reindeer needs another type of grazing depending on the season. This is the area where my reindeers are grazing. On the map, you also see all the disturbances that are on these lands. And if we go closer to the area around the city of Kiruna in northern Sweden, uh, you will see you will see the nowadays the most vulnerable and the most essential area for the migration from summer to winter grazing lands. It is also, as you see, uh, the huge mine, El Kabe, which is growing for every day. In the area, there are also other kind of explorations, such, such as the city, of course, uh, uh, infrastructure like railways, wind power station, military training area, and other open digging mining that they want to build or reopen. And in Sweden, um, there's a quite a generous um, mineral act given the possibilities to open mines basically everywhere. Even though Sweden and the Nordic countries uh, has fairly good environmental legislations compared to others. So this is El Kabe, uh, and as I said, it's growing. And it's growing so much that they will eventually have to move all the city to another site because of the iron ore body uh, that continues under the city. And since the colonialism hasn't ended yet, we as the indigenous people on those lands are forced to adapt or to transform our li livelihood. In the name of the state, both as the owner of El Kabe and the decision maker, this is all done in the name of sustainability. El Kabe usually uh, blames other countries and companies saying that they uh, violate human rights and kill for exploration uh, and uh, that they uh, will continue to, to um, work as they do because they are more humane. The capacity and forces to move a huge city is, yeah, is great. Since the state are making the decisions without any influence uh, by the Sami people nor the reindeer herders, this is what is happening. We have to change migration tracks and use other areas. But there are no other areas. And as always, we have to move for the exploitation, exploration, even though we, the indigenous peoples on those lands, are the experts and the keepers of those lands. I want to be clear on saying that this is not only happening uh, on the lands that my reindeers are grazing on. This is happening everywhere, uh, and lots of grazing lands within the reindeer herding area. Usually, those who are fighting against are applying that we can coexist in the same area. Uh, area. Well, I don't know about coexisting. There's nothing to coexist on. I want to quote that uh, what one of the largest mining companies in Sweden uh, said concerning a new mine that they wanted to uh, want to open on winter grazing land belonging to another Sami uh, village in Västerbotten county. And it said, the planned mine is not in large a threat against the reindeer husbandry. These two businesses can exist in the same areas together. If there is a conflict between the extraction and the reindeer husbandry, the company means that considering in a long-term long and society beneficial perspective, the mining extraction should be prioritized. So apparently these are the guys who are experts on our lands and how to use them. And quite often the authorities listen to 
the, their opinion and, and give them permiss permissions. So is it then weird that why the indigenous peoples of the world are suffering in large scale from mental illness? The states are, in fact, stealing the lands of our children. Anxiety, depression, and the struggle for land are eroding the powers and vitality of young herders. And in Sweden, one in three reindeer herders between the age of 18 and 29 have considered suicide. One in three. And this is in Sweden. But there are some good sides too, and some good examples on managing traditional lands belonging to the indigenous people, even though they are a few. Laponia is, uh, is an area consisting of four national parks and two nature reserves on grazing lands belonging to the husbandry. This is also uh, a UNESCO World Heritage since 1996. This area is managed by traditional knowledge and on terms that echoes our way of making decisions, which often is done by consensus. The board consists of representatives from the Sami village, the reindeer herding districts, and uh, uh, two, also two from the municipalities and the county. And in this board, the indigenous peoples have the majority, even though the decisions are taken in uh, consensus. Yes, I'm finishing up. Uh, in this type of management, our land and areas uh, are able to use that traditional knowledge and take care of the biodiversity, the sustainability, and the development. But even though this area is an UNESCO World Heritage and part of the land uh, are national parks, the mining extraction is threatening in it. The mining company Beowulf Mining uh, wants to open uh, 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 open an open digging mine in the area which will kill the traditional uh, reindeer husbandry on those land. Laponia depends on these animals. Without the animals, the biodiversity, the Sami traditions and knowledges is lost and that will probably be the end on the landscape and the world heritage too. So this is in process. Uh, the Swedish government will probably soon get that on their table. So we will see what kind of future we get from that. And those will be my concluding words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Per Jonas. He is representing our youth who, who are the next generation who will be taking on our traditional knowledge into the future. Now, I, can I uh, ask Justin Adam to take on and introduce the next set of speakers? Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Justin Adams. I work for the Nature Conservancy and head up our Global Lands Program. Um, but I'm going to uh, invite uh, Maximiliano uh, Correa Menezes uh, uh, to come and say a few words. Um, uh, Maximiliano is the leader of the Tucano indigenous people in the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, he is also the general coordinator of uh, Coyabe, which is a very important uh, group that coordinates all of the indigenous organizations throughout the Brazilian Amazon. So we very much look forward to your remarks, Maximiliano. I would like to greet our colleagues here on the panel and also the audience. A very good afternoon. My name is Maximiliano Menezes. I belong to the Tucano uh, people. I come from the Brazilian Amazon and I am the general coordinator of the organi indigenous organizations of the Brazilian Amazon. I'd like to show you the logo brands we have as indigenous organization and the way we are organizing ourselves in order to 
defend our rights, the rights to land tenure, to education, health, and also the right to develop and steward our lands the way we want to, according to our needs. Koyab is uh, here in the center of this brand. Koyab means coordination of indigenous organizations of the Brazilian Amazon. There's uh, another organization, which is the organization of the indigenous people of Brazil, organizing in Brazil. We try to coordinate the regions where there are uh, organization, association of indigenous people. Another, the other logo brand uh, organization is COICA. I belong to this organization as well, and we coordin coordinate the indigenous organization of the Amazon Cuenca. So it's uh, many uh, people, and this is the way we are organized to defend our rights in the Amazon region. You see the map in pinkish purple, you see the indigenous lands, uh, those that are already, uh, that are ours, that are already uh, recognized, but they are also the scenery for a lot of, a lot of violence because there, are, there is illegal mining and also um, deforestation, which, is, which violates uh, our right to live on our land, to have our uh, agriculture activities, fishing, our economical, political life. So we are under attack even on our land. And the green areas are the protected area, but they are also they are also um, the lands for the agribusiness, soya and soy and other culture. Indigenous people need the forest to to live and to preserve the, the indigenous uh, way of life, but this is a way of life that is also endangered. You see here the position of the Brazilian state against the uh, indigenous people. The yellow areas are mainly in the Brazilian Amazon. We 90% of uh, indigenous land are in the Amazon, on the north of Brazil, and in the, the south, it's only 1%. Therefore, there are huge problems of uh, land tenure. The people, some uh, landowners have a huge, uh, large amount of lands for um, cultivation to for the cultivation of soy, and so the indigenous tribe of Guarani or Kayowa in these areas are under attack of the um, farmers who have uh, gunmen who kill the indigenous people. Indigenous or not, we must all uh, cooperate to fight together and to resist the massacre of the indigenous tribes. Uh, this can be through the National Congress or other constitutional ways and means that exist to protect our rights. The blue dots, the blue dots are hydro, hydroelectrical uh, plants that are going to be built in the Amazon area. Hydroelectrical plant uh, is welcome when it is built uh, through partnership, when it's discussed uh, 
to avoid um, a negative impact on the indigenous tribe. But when there is no dialogue, there is no consultation of the indigenous tribes, you know that all the um, different indigenous tribes or the, um, the descendants of uh, former slaves will all be negatively affected and our rights will be violated. The red lines are the roads. The roads, when they are built, they are built in order to uh, transport the production, but not of our production, production of the result of mining and other illegal uh, extractive activities and production. And this is taken uh, out of Brazil or to the south of Brazil. This And there too, if you want to build a road, uh, you share uh, the parts to you, you share the road between the farmers or the indigenous tribe, but you have to discuss it beforehand. The indigenous rights that are not respected. One of the the PEC. 2015. This is a proposal of constitutional amendment that is uh, that is proposed by the government and that is violating our rights. But in the legislative system, in the uh, in the parliament, Brazilian parliament, there is a group of uh, landowners of huge, great landowners who want to develop uh, agribusiness, uh, their own business, and they want to see the end of the indigenous people. This bill is in direct violation of our rights, and I'm absolutely sure that uh, our brothers, our indigenous tribe are right now demonstrating in front of the National Congress against this bill, the PEC 2015. But the Brazilian state just does not uh, apply what, he, what it has signed. It doesn't consult the indigenous tribe, although it has committed itself to doing so. You see that legally, our uh, land belong to the union, the union, uh, Brazilian Union, and yet uh, the Brazilian state does not comply with uh, the international instrument it has ratified. As for the companies that uh, have activities or will have activities on our lands, we are trying to have a dialogue and to have a partnership, a concrete work to build. Um, development policy in our region, but taking into account our demands and our needs. So what we are saying is you must have a dialogue with us. You must also uphold our right so that we have a policy, a development policy that is good for all of us. In this, pic this picture was taken a week ago. We have uh, we have uh, built um, a proposal of guidelines uh, taking into account uh, the needs of the indigenous tribes. We indigenous people, we want to be part of the development, but we want to uh, take part uh, concretely and really for the development of our lands. Thank you. Maximiliano, thank you so much. Very, very inspiring and passionate um, about all the issues you're, you're dealing with in the Amazon. From, from Brazil, we're going to move uh, to Indonesia. And it's with enormous pleasure that I invite uh, Pak Leji uh, to the stage. Uh, Pak Leji is a traditional leader uh, from the Waheya um, uh, lands in East Kalimantan, in East Katai. Uh, he is had receiver of many awards in Indonesia for his work conserving forests uh, and uh, and his work with the, uh, the traditional peoples uh, in Indonesia. So it's a great pleasure to to welcome you, Pakleji.
And I should say, Pek Leji will speak in Bahasa and then be translated uh, um, by uh, Pak Saipo. Uh, terima kasih. Selamat sore. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nama saya adalah Lejeta, uh, suku Dayak Uhea di uh, Borneo, Indonesia. My name is Lejitak, uh, head of a Borneon uh, Dayaknis tribe. Uh, saya adalah kepala adat Dayak Uhea. I'm a leader of a uh, customary, customary leader of uh, Uhea uh, Dayaknis people. Indigenous people. Saya mau bercerita tentang apa yang pernah kami alami. Would like to share a story about our experiences. Pada awalnya kami orang Dayak Wea sangat dekat dengan hutan dan kami menganggap hutan sebagai lumbung kehidupan. In very beginning, we are Dayaknis people who live in Kalimantan, live in harmony with forest. Karena kami menganggap bahwa hasil itu dapat kami dapat di hutan, kemudian kehidupan kami juga bisa kami dapat di hutan, bahan obat-obatan juga dapat di hutan, kemudian bahan bangunan kami dapat di hutan. Oleh sebab itu kami menganggap hutan itu sebagai lumbung kehidupan. Because we got everything from the forest. We got uh, medicine, we got uh, food, we got uh, everything from, from the forest. So forests provide everything for us. Sejak masuknya perusahaan logging tahun 1972, eh, kemudian masuk lagi belakangan ini adalah perusahaan perkebunan sawit, akhirnya kami tersisih dari hutan kami sendiri. Since 1972, when uh, logging concessions coming, and then after that, uh, oil palm companies coming to, this, to, the, to the villages, we, we, they depleted everything. They cut our forest. Uh, kemudian, uh, kami merasa tersisih akhirnya uh, pada tahun 2000, uh, dua dan 2003 ada uh, survei yang dilakukan oleh uh, Universitas Melawarman Fakultas Kehutanan dan menemukan di daerah ini ada kurang lebih 600 uh, sarang orang hutan. In 2002 and 2003 there was a survey led by a local university called Melawarman University, found that about 600 orangutans live in our forest. Uh, kemudian, mereka akan mengadakan uh, perlindungan terhadap hutan ini dengan hutan tujuan khusus. They plan to make a conservation activity in the forest to protect the orangutan. Karena ini masuk wilayah tanah adat kami, maka kami mengambil alih untuk uh, melindungi hutan ini. Because this area is included in our land, in our traditional land, so we, we had an initiative to take over the initiative and then we led the initiative. Uh, kemudian, kami mengadakan rapat adat uh, sekitar November 2004. Akhirnya, uh, bulan November itu juga kami mengukuhkan uh, hutan ini menjadi uh, dengan cara adat. We had a big meeting in our uh, customary council that we decided at that time to offer uh, over to take over the, the land and then to lead the initiative to protect the orangutan. Kemudian 2005 kami mengadakan rapat adat lagi untuk melindungi hutan itu dengan aturan adat. Kemudian sekaligus membentuk PM uh, semacam ranger untuk menjaga hutan. In 2005, we decided to protect or uh, to protect the forest by develop by establishing what we call PM is a kind of uh, forest guard to protect and have patrolling. 
uh, kami membuka pendaftaran untuk uh, PM atau Ranger. Akhirnya secara sukarela ada 35 orang mendaftar untuk menjaga hutan. There are 35 people uh, registered uh, in the beginning to be the, uh, the first guardian. Pada awalnya kami tidak menggaji mereka karena mereka merasa trauma dengan keadaan yang ada, kayu sudah mau habis, binatang juga mau habis, akhirnya mereka mau menjaga hutan ini. We didn't pay them. This is because their consciousness, this is because their awareness to protect their forest. Kemudian kami menulis surat kepada pemerintah daerah, kepada bupati dan gubernur untuk memohon bantuan dana kepada uh, pemerintah supaya teman-teman uh, PM ini dapat uh, honor untuk menjaga hutan dan uh, logistiknya. After that, we send a letter to local government, to the provincial and to the district level, to the head of the district, to support us financially. Nah, akhirnya itu dikabulkan. Kemudian kami melanjutkan penjagaan hutan itu sampai saat ini. And we get a funding from the government. Kemudian uh, hutan ini luasnya kurang lebih 38.000 hektar. The, the, the forest is 38.000 hectares. Sebenarnya jumlah hutan adat yang kita uh, miliki itu uh, kurang lebih 380.000 hektar. Basically our initial forest is about 360 360.000 hectares. Uh, kemudian Belakangan kami juga uh, bekerja sama dengan pihak perusahaan, perusahaan perkebunan, yaitu uh, PT uh, DIN, uh, untuk menjaga hutan konservasi seluas uh, 1.500 hektar. In addition, an oil palm company offer us a, an opportunity to protect their SCV area outside of our forest. Uh, sampai sekarang ini tugas-tugas mereka adalah patroli, kemudian mengidentifikasi uh, flora dan fauna yang ada di situ. They accept the offers from the, from the company and then they have patrolling in the uh, area of the company to protect uh, and also to have uh, inventory, uh, the wildlife inventory. Uh, kemudian uh, PM ini terbagi dua, ada yang di hutan lindung hia yang uh, seluas 38.000 hektar dan ada yang di uh, hutan konservasi yang 1.500 hektar. We split the guardians, the forest guard into two, one group to protect our Wehian forest, our original forest, and the second one, the second group of the guard, the guardian to protect uh, ICV area in the company's concession. Uh, kemudian perusahaan ini juga membantu uh, kami sebagian uh, PM yang menjaga uh, hutan konservasi itu dibantu oleh uh, pihak perusahaan dan uh, kami bekerja sama uh, ada sekitar dua tahun lebih ini. As the compensation from the companies to the community, they give the, com the community Uh, an operational funding to have patrolling not only in the uh, in the concessions but also to protect their forest protection the protected forest uh, kami tidak bekerja sendiri kami juga uh, bekerja sama dengan pihak pemerintah daerah kemudian bekerja sama dengan pihak swasta uh, terutama uh, ada tensi ada uh, perusahaan uh, sawit kemudian ada propauna yang membantu kami We are not working alone to protect our forests. We work with government, we got funding from government, we work with uh, companies, as I mentioned earlier, oil palm companies. We also work with uh, civil society, NGOs like the Nature Conservancy, like Flora and Fauna and other uh, civil society. Uh, kemudian, kami juga membuka diri untuk uh, beberapa 
perusahaan yang mau bekerja sama dengan kami dengan pihak siapapun untuk membantu kami dalam mengelola hutan ini. We welcome everyone who want to contribute to protect our forest. Uh, kami juga menolak uh, tambang apapun bentuknya di wilayah tanah adat kami enam desa Wehea di Kecamatan Muara Bahawa, Kabupaten Kutai Timur, Kalimantan Timur, Indonesia ini. But we refuse the idea of mining in our area. Kemudian kami uh, tidak mau pemerintah menerbitkan izin izin tambang dan izin perkebunan baru lagi uh, di wilayah tanah adat kami. We gave recommendation to local government to not releasing any new licenses like uh, mining and oil palm. Uh, sebenarnya kami tersisih ya banyak uh, masyarakat yang uh, menekan kami dan perusahaan-perusahaan menekan kami uh, sehingga kami mengharapkan pengakuan dari pihak pemerintah terhadap masyarakat uh, adat WEA karena kami adalah minoritas supaya kami dapat melindungi hutan dan menjaga uh, hutan itu dengan baik dan melestarikannya dengan baik. Basically to be honest that we don't really get our rights but we get uh, we 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 expect the support from stakeholders to help us to get our rights back. Uh, kami sampai saat ini masih melakukan upacara adat dan kami adalah masyarakat adat yang tetap masih melaksanakan upacara adat. So we are practicing our traditional belief that we are still uh, having our ceremonies, spiritual ceremonies. Dan kami mengharapkan uh, di tempat yang kami lindungi itu supaya bisa tumbuh tanaman obat, supaya bisa tumbuh bahan upacara adat dan bahan-bahan uh, yang dapat kami gunakan untuk keperluan hidup kami. We hope that we can get everything including the things that we use for ceremonies, for spiritual beliefs, ceremonies uh, from our forest. Uh, kalau kami ada uh, dana, kami saat ini juga selalu uh, membawa anak sekolah ke hutan untuk mengenalkan hutan, uh, kemudian membawa orang tua, ibu-ibu, uh, perempuan-perempuan, laki-laki ke, ke dalam hutan waktunya sekitar uh, dua bulan sekali. In the meantime, to raise, to raise the awareness, We invite lady, we invite uh, people, especially the young generations, to go inside the forest and filling the forest. How the forest give the maximum benefits for the community. Uh, pada waktu kita menjaga hutan ini, waktu kebakaran ini di tempat kita itu tidak pernah ada kebakaran karena uh, masyarakat kami selalu menjaga hutan. If you may heard about forest fire problems in Indonesia. Because of our protection to our forest, we don't have any problems with the haze problem, with the forest fire problem, because we protect our forest. Uh, kami mengharapkan bantuan dari uh, siapapun, pihak pemerintah, dari siapa saja untuk membantu masyarakat kami uh, dalam hal pendanaan, dalam hal pembinaan terhadap masyarakat kami, karena kami minoritas untuk dapat uh, menjaga dan melindungi hutan kami uh, selanjutnya. We welcome everyone to come to our forest and give support to us. Demikian, terima kasih. Thank you very much. Hakleji, thank you so much for your terima kasih. Uh, so now uh, we're going to switch uh, gears slightly because we've heard five indigenous voices, five very powerful but very different indigenous voices. And the last two speakers we have, we have a very ambitious panel of fitting seven speakers in, but the last two we have uh, is uh, firstly a representative from government and then a representative from the private sector. So um, to start with, I would like to invite uh, Pak uh, Waratno uh, to the stage. Um, uh, Pak is from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry in Indonesia uh, and is the Director of Social Forestry there. He's also very involved in the ASEAN um, forestry programs across the whole of the Southeast Asia. So 
Pakwood Farm. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I think we have witnessed that uh, local community is uh, a part of the solution in the natural resource management, as part of the check proof in the last 15 years, I believe. And uh, I myself, I personally believe that local community, indigenous people as, as in the center of development, as part of the solution. My minister also believe on that, also my president. I hope, I do hope he believes. That's why he launched a very ambitious program, 12.7 million hectare of the state forest land have to be delivered to the right target, to the local community, near the forest in the next five years. That is the message that, that I want to share to you, to the global community. I would say now or never. This is about 10% of the state forest land. This has never happened in the last 70 years since independence in Indonesia. Land is farmer, poor farmer, forest dependent community, forest encroachers, illegal loggers, com customary area. But we can do this if there is a strong leadership, very strong and consistent leadership at all level, from Jakarta, province, district, also at the very, at the side level, like Pak Legitech. Do you agree or not? Strong leadership. Second, we need the support from, it is the classic issue of uh, integration, integrated development program across the minister also from Jakarta to, from central to local level. Integrated program, it is very easy to mention, but it's difficult in this, the collaboration. Also CSOs and private sector. But again, Pak Legitech proof that the private sector can work with him. Thai Conservation Value Forest, managed by Pak Legitech family, this happened. Another case is also we have to work with scientists. We should got the support from the parliament, from the politician. Of course, financial management support, media campaigns, that this is the way we, how we work and manage our forest not only managed by the private sector, but also with the local people. In Indonesia, we have about 70,000 villages across Indonesia, across the country, and 30,000 villages located very close to the forest. They depend on the forest resources. And of course, the global funding agencies, we need to support from them also with the long terms. But it is not the, I, many times I mention, it is not the political numbers. So it is 2.5 million hectares per year we have to deliver our state forest land. Lesson from here, here is, is, is very uh, interesting that uh, the local community, they are legitimate only uh, 600 household, but they are very strong under his strong leadership. Yeah, with the support from, from uh, the first time from, from TNC, and then 
in the last 10 years. It's very consistent, and uh, we th finally they, they got the uh, attention from local government, and then from private sector, and then now from the central government. The key success that we learned from Beheya is long-term partnership, long-term collaboration, joining collaboration, start from mutual respect, mutual trust, and mutual benefit. What we call it now, the development of local governance, shared governance. And finally, he asked about legal recognition. Thank you very much. Um, so our last speaker, Antonio Fonseca dos Santos, uh, is the Director of Environment and Sustainability for Brookfield Renewable Energy, uh, based in Brazil. Uh, I think he'll bring a, a very different perspective from the private sector. Uh, so, Antonio, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Good evening. Today I'm going to speak a little about respecting, recognizing, and supporting the indigenous people's rights. Um, a little bit about Brookfield. Brookfield is a global renewable energy company that has more than 250 facilities around the world with 7,300 megawatts of installed capacity in three continents. In North America, we have operations in Canada and United States, in Europe, in the United Kingdom and Portugal, and in Latin America, in Brazil. In Brazil, the company owns uh, 40 small hydropower plants, four biomass thermal power plants that runs on sugar cane bagasse, and five wind powers, uh, totaling more than 100 uh, 1,100 megawatts, most as you can see in the map, in the southwest, midwest, and south regions of Brazil. Only the wind farms are up in the northeast. Brookfield, when uh, talking about Aboriginal relationship values, the company has a vision. Uh, our Aboriginal relationship principles are based on the fundamental values of honesty, respect, and open communication. We recognize and respect that every community has its own distinctive culture, traditions, and values. And we know that the Aboriginal peoples, they are the original inhabitants of this land. And for that simple reason, they have some specific rights. From this vision comes seven principles that the company works with. Uh, the principles are there. We act responsibly and honorably in our business relationship. We respect and uphold the agreements we make. We recognize the special relationship that the Aboriginal peoples have with the land. We are committed to the sustainable use and preservation of the environment for future generations. We develop partnership with the Aboriginal communities. We engage in timely, respectful, and meaningful consultation to ensure the successful implementation of our partnership, we have to coordinate not only with the First Nations, but also with the appropriate federal and local agencies. And the last, the, the, this one is very important. We implement awareness programs throughout our organization to increase our own understanding and appreciation of Aboriginal histories, culture, traditions, and rights. And we keep continuing uh, improving. Uh, adapting our guidelines, programs, and initiatives to meet the changing needs of our business and the Aboriginal communities. From this principle, we have some guidelines. That's how we apply our vision and our principles in our relationships. Uh, the main success factor is early, open, and transparent communications, our First Nation partnership approach. We apply new ways of engagement that better recognize not only the legislation, but the Aboriginal rights, the, and the legitimate local interests and the environment, and we involve the public, stakeholders, and First Nations since the early planning of the process. And when I say early planning, is since the beginning, since the basic project, uh, discussing and accepting suggestions, and we discuss meaningful economic development not only the development that brings during the construction time, that is that's the, the, the employment that goes there, no. Since the permitting time, the construction time, and during the, all, the, all the operation, 
and also the ownership, that is, give ownership of the projects to the, to the communities. There is a lot of mechanisms in Canada. There are more uh, uh, elaborate uh, mechanisms to, to funding this, this ownership through equ equity participation. And with all this framework that's going on in Brookfield uh, for more than 100 years, uh, we are very glad uh, to be part of the Business and Indigenous People Dialogue Initiative Forum that's going on in Brazil under the leadership of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I myself uh, am a part of the Intersectorial Articulation Nucleus that they are the working group of this initiative. Uh, we, we, we talk a lot, we have had a lot of work in this stuff, okay? This initiative has members representing all economic sectors in Brazil, the industry sector, mining sector, energy sector, agribusiness sector, and also all the indigenous communities in Brazil. And uh, after two years and a half of work, uh, two weeks ago, as Mr. Maximiliano just told you, this initiative launched the proposal for Brazilian guidelines of good corporate practice with indigenous people. These proposals have five main objectives. It's to promote and exchange experiences regarding cooperative relations between companies and indigenous people, identify potential for inclusive business investment with indigenous people, contribute to the reduction of tensions in the relations between indigenous people and business, analyze, systematize national and international experience of good practice, and mainly develop guidelines for good corporate practice standards with indigenous people in Brazil, which can serve as reference for companies and indigenous people. Brookfield already has many partnerships in North America and Canada, in projects in operation and in development phase, uh, with the, the NMG First Nations and others, but I'm gonna talk about one that we are developing in Brazil, that is with the Kaingangi and Guarani First Nation people. That's hydropower, uh, it's a small hydropower called Xanxere. It is in the Chapecozinho River. This river runs in the state of Santa Catarina, south of Brazil, and this power plant uh, will neighbor uh, Naninja Reservation where 5,500 native Kengen Guarani live. Uh, this remark that they put there, there's no reservoir, uh, the layout was discussed with the indigenous community. Uh, when we start the project, the first project for see a dam and a lake, and then uh, before a lot of conversation with the people in the, in the village, I was there and this conversation started in 2001. That's almost 14 years of conversation. And during this period, we brought engineers from Brookfield talking with the people, and we changed the layout of the power plant from a dam and lake to a diversion of river uh, with no reservoir. Uh, and this project, uh, there's two main things that we are, we, we are doing. First, cap we capacitate native people to understand the new laws and the new responsibilities according to the Constitution of Brazil, and we get their approval for the terms of reference for the environmental impact assessment studies since the beginning, okay? And the second one is reach an agreement. And this agreement, among all the other uh, benefits that's developing agricultural plans and research, the main one is the participation of the community as owners of the project, as partners with a share of the project. The, the people there, the Indian Reservation has a share of this power plant, uh, will have, okay? The current situation, uh, with the agreement signed on the terms of reference approved by the native community, Brookfield, together with the native people, we develop a framework based on the new legislation and we approach the environmental authority and FUNAI, that is the Indigenous People Federal Agency, as owners of the, pre the project, Brookfield and the Indian people, we came to the, 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 the federal agencies and the permitting agencies to uh, go on the project, to make the project go on. 
the approach was successful, allowing the start of the environment impact assessment studies and the beginning of the licensing process. The social assessment study, that's a part of the mandatory environmental assessment, started just last November, the month ago, and is being done by an indigenous consultant company that was formed in that region during that, all this time of, of uh, conversation. Uh, in conclusion, there's four small conclusions that I wanna uh, point out. The very first step to construct a trustworthy relationship with the native community is based on clear and transparent communication, okay? It's very important to reach an agreement with native people, having them as partners of the project. It's very important to empower the native people so they can real, really behave as owners of the process. They will help you, they will help the process to go on. And finally, uh, this, we are not sure that we will guarantee the success of the project, but having them, the First, First Nations as owners, as the spirit of Brazilian constitutions intends to, will not only help to achieve the environmental license and the construction of the power plant, but ensure a more sustainable project that supports and meets the needs of the most important stakeholders that are the people that live in the land. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. Um, so we were hoping that we would have 15 minutes or so for questions, but uh, we've had such a broad set of uh, input from all the panelists that uh, I'm gonna look to find somebody who's in charge to find out how long we actually have, because I assume that we probably need to wrap. Is there anybody in charge? <laughs> we're gonna do a question or we're gonna wrap? We have to wrap, okay. Um, so let me, let me just make three concluding remarks and it's impossible to try and cover all of the comments that have been made and I, I'm sure I speak for many of you to say I wish actually we could go into a much richer discussion that would, uh, would require double the time. Um, but the three remarks are firstly, we can't achieve uh, the outcomes any of us are here for without addressing indigenous people's rights without addressing the indigenous people's um, custodianship uh, of the natural resources. They are the natural stewards of our resources. And unless we bring uh, their voices much more strongly into our international agreements, we cannot achieve anything that is lasting uh, for all the people who are gathered here in Paris these two weeks. Uh, we can't achieve our goals without it. There are 70 trillion dollars of infrastructure that are gonna get built in the next few decades. Without involving indigenous people, we are gonna end up making more and more decisions. We're gonna end up disempowering more and more indigenous peoples from around the world. You heard five stories. There's stories of hope, but there's also continuing stories of uh, indigenous people's rights being neglected, of their voices not being heard. And that can't continue. So the second point is partnerships are absolutely critical. Uh, it's a point that everybody made. It's an easy word to say. It's far harder uh, to actually do. It's interesting to hear Antonio's comment that the discussions uh, for the dam in, in uh, for the hydropower project in southern Brazil, there's been 14 years of discussion up to this point. Partnership takes a long time, particularly after centuries uh, where rights have not been respected. So it's gonna take time, but it's so, so important that we find ways of addressing this. We cannot achieve the sustainable development goals. We can't achieve a climate stabilization goal without creating much more innovative partnerships between indigenous peoples, between government, between private sector, between civil society. And we have to take the time to slow down to actually do that. We have to move beyond growth at any cost to genuinely recognizing that sustainable development is what we all need to have a healthy, prosperous um, future for the planet, for the people on the planet, and for all the future generations that come. And that really brings me to the last point, which uh, I'm reminded of in listening to all the indigenous voices this afternoon, and every time I've had the honor to, to visit indigenous territories, uh, of how humbling it is when you stop to listen 
of the traditional knowledge that exists around the world that for centuries we have seen as a barrier to progress, but actually is probably the key to how we find systemic solutions to these very challenging problems that we're facing. We can't have, as Grace said right at the beginning, business as usual is not going to be good enough. So we have to find a new way of addressing the problems that we're facing. And actually the understanding, the knowledge that the indigenous communities around the world have will be essential to unlock new pathways for a development for all of our futures, uh, for the planet's future, for uh, every person's future. And businesses are starting to recognize that. There's some great examples, but there's not nearly enough examples and similarly government. So I want to please ask you all to join me in thanking everybody who's come to talk on the panel. Thank you for listening. I hope you're all taking something away from the conversation this afternoon. Uh, I know I certainly am, and there's many, many more things that need to be discussed, but thank you all.